why people are worrying about the Cold War is coming back. Because some people have a Cold War mentality. Welcome to Conversations. I'm Muhtadar Khan, your host. And today, I'm going to talk to you about China's foreign policy. Uh, China has appointed a new foreign minister, Qin Gong. And Qin Gong has written an article uh, articulating how China sees the world and what China's foreign policy priorities are and what the key elements of foreign policy that we can expect uh, going forward. Qin Gong uh, was until recently the Chinese foreign minister to the US, and he wrote this article uh, in, in the magazine uh, National Interest, which is one of the most important uh, foreign policy and national security uh, forums for discussion uh, in the United States and has a global impact. I also have written a couple of articles on India for the national interest. And so if you're on the web page of national interest, reading Qingong, uh, do also uh, take a look at the articles that I have written. But before I unpack for you Qingong's uh, worldview or his vision, uh, of uh, China's worldview, uh, please subscribe to Conversations, like the video, and don't forget to share it with your social network. Do ring the bell icon. It, it will send you notifications when I post my next video. So Xin Gong is a diplomat who has worked uh, for the Chinese government for 30 years. He has a bachelor's degree in international relations and his last posting was uh, as a US, as a Chinese ambassador to the United States. And in this article in the national interest, uh, he's basically the title of that article is how does China see the world? He, he makes four important points, I think, and I'm going to discuss them in the order in which they appear in his article. He points out that China recently had its, uh, the Communist Party had its convention. He does not uh, feel the need to mention that Xi Jinping has uh, become president for a third term, which is quite unprecedented. Uh, but uh, he does point out that in that convention uh, of the Communist Party, uh, they have articulated a vision of the foreign policy and which is what is informing this article that he wrote. It was interesting. It got published just three or four days before uh, he, his uh, promotion to foreign minister was announced. So he argues uh, that uh, China sees the world uh, as one community with a shared future. Uh, and uh, I mean, these are platitudes, but nevertheless, uh, no different from India's vision uh, of the world as Vasudeva Kutumbakum as one family. So he says this is also a very Confucian idea and that the world is one community. Uh, anyway, so it's a world, one community and we have a shared future and therefore we are all invested and we are all stakeholders in the well-being, development and prosperity of our planet. So the first point that he makes is that because China considers the world as one community with a shared future, it is on a path of reform. It is very interesting. The first point he, he makes is a kind of an acknowledgement that there is need for reform in China's conduct, in China's foreign policy. Uh, and uh, it is interesting because there is a lot of demand from the rest of the world that uh, China make significant reforms. Uh, so anyway, but when he talks about reforms, he basically talks about the ease with which you can do business with China. He says, now China is ranked 31st on some index in terms of investment and doing business. It has jumped up in the last 10 years over 66 uh, ranking points, and therefore there is evidence of reform. Uh, and he talks about, basically brags about the fact that China has made adjustments uh, to its uh, domestic political economy, uh, and therefore is ready for more trade, for more investments, uh, and for more uh, economic engagement with the world. Uh, no discussion of political reforms, uh, no acknowledgement that there might be perceptions in China, outside China, uh, that there, there needs to be some kind of political reforms, no reference uh, to what's going on in Hong Kong either. The second point that he makes is that because China believes in one community and a shared future, it is on a path of peaceful development. 
And so this is, I think, uh, going to be one of the main talking points of China and going forward that China is committed to peaceful development. China believes that it is still a developing country and it wants to develop more, become more prosperous, uh, more economically developed, more advanced. Uh, and any hostilities towards China, containing China, marginalizing China would be uh, an effort to, to put impediments in the path of development. So China believes in paths of peaceful development. The purpose of its development is peaceful uh, and the pathway that it's going to adopt towards development is peaceful. It does acknowledge, however, that there are three problems that it faces. Uh, from a geopolitical perspective, it, uh, he identifies uh, Taiwan, the South China Sea, and also makes a reference to the border uh, disputes that he, uh, China has been having with India, two episodes, one in 2020 uh, and one most recently uh, in 2022. Uh, and so he says that we're going to be talking with India and both of us are committed uh, to peacefully moving forward. And as far as Taiwan and South China Sea, uh, issues are concerned, uh, he does not, uh, he obviously disagrees with uh, most of the world's perception that China is being very aggressive in these two areas and essentially uh, makes the point that China is responding to the aggression from Japan and South China Sea uh, and uh, the, the increasing, uh, I guess, chatter about independence from Taiwan and the frequency with which uh, uh, U.S. Uh, politicians are traveling to, to Taiwan. Uh, in his discussion at the Aspen Institute, he does point out while talking about Taiwan that it does appear that the United States has, has kind of moved away from the one China policy and is perhaps uh, more committed to uh, to Taiwan and Taiwan's defense and therefore encouraging those who seek independence in Taiwan, which is an undermining of the one China policy. So basically he's trying to explain what the world sees as China's aggression in South China Sea, as well as towards Taiwan as essentially defensive measures uh, in response to provocations from Japan and the US and Taiwan. His third point is about Ukraine. It's a very interesting way he argues. He says that uh, war is not a good idea, obviously. One of the lessons that we have learned from this is that no matter who's fighting the war, you, you will get hurt. But he says that China is committed to peaceful negotiations and uh, talks as if there are two sets of adversaries uh, in this conflict. So he says China is committed to peaceful negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. And China is committed to peaceful negotiations between Russia and EU, NATO, and the USA. So basically, it appears that China sees that there are two conflicts taking place. One, Russia is with Ukraine, and then Russia is with, uh, with the West. Now, that is an interesting way to see. I don't think people in the West will see it that way. Here in Washington, we see the, our role as essentially defending Ukraine from an unfair and unjust uh, and aggressive war, a brutal war from Russia. Uh, so it is an interesting thing. We'll have to see uh, what it really means. Uh, so are they going to play a role in making peace? Uh, we advocate that national sovereignty and the territorial integrity of all countries must be respected. The purposes and the principles of the United Nations Charter must be upheld. The legitimate con security concerns of all countries must be taken seriously. And all efforts conducive to the peaceful settlement must be supported. So China's stance is fair and objective. China doesn't stand alone. This is the similar or same situation as many other developing countries, including India, South Africa, Brazil, and Indonesia.
while he did talk about how China sees the world, it's like an article in ontology. He does not uh, hint at what policies China is going to pursue going forward. So it doesn't say what posture China is going to pursue vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, for example. And he does not even uh, explain whether China is going to play a positive role in trying to bring about these peace negotiations between Russia and Ukraine and Russia and the West that he feels are necessary. His last point is about Biden's vision of uh, the world as divided between democracies and autocracies. And he basically says that this is not a zero-sum game uh, and uh, such talk essentially is divisive. It divides the world into camps, which is how Biden sees the world at the moment. And he says that is not good. Uh, it will impede development and war and conflict are not really good. And so basically he tries to debunk this idea and that China does not see that it's a uh, at the Aspen Institute, he gave a, a much more uh, comprehensive answer in which he says that uh, he China is much more happier with Biden's uh, response rather than Trump's approach towards China. And he says that Biden has very good words. He likes the words that Biden is using. Biden has denied that the U.S. is in a cold war with China on several occasions. And the Chinese welcome that. We have noted that the Biden administration uh, has uh, very serious commitments uh, about China-U.S. relations. You know, uh, this, the words are positive, and we hope that uh, words can be translated into deeds. Uh, the key issue is that you know. Can the U.S. accept the development of China? The country is very different from the United States historically, politically, and culturally. So these are the four points that are key in that article. But while he does a good job of seeing how China sees the world, China sees the world uh, as uh, an opportunity for engagement and development. And it is also clear that China sees itself as a peaceful actor on the world stage that is occasionally provoked by others and therefore is compelled to respond aggressively, but otherwise China is really um, a very friendly neighbor uh, and uh, with a singular purpose, which is to develop and to help others develop peacefully. So that seems to be um, the summary of the article in that sense. It's a short piece, obviously, uh, and it does not uh, provide any signal that the, the convention that was held recently uh, is going to have some kind of a change uh, in, in Chinese foreign policy, uh, given the fact that there is a fear that there is going to be a cold war between China and the US, are we going to see a more conciliatory, more cooperative China, more willing to accommodate other countries, more willing to negotiate first rather than bully? Uh, none of that has come across in this article, and I hope that uh, there were more reassuring words in this article, especially when it was written just a couple of days before he was announced as the new foreign minister of China. I am sure he probably knew uh, about that promotion when he had penned this article. Uh, so in that sense, for those of who are not very familiar with China's foreign policy and China's grand strategy. This article may provide some uh, uh, some vision and some insights, uh, but uh, it does not uh, provide any uh, thought-provoking uh, insights into China's future behavior. So it's basically this, is China's future, near future, that is Xi Jinping's third term as president of China and leader of the Communist Party, is that going to produce the same kind of foreign policy as the last term? That is the question that this article does not answer. So I hope you found my analysis and my summary useful. You can go and read the article. I will post the link to the article uh, in the video's description. 
Uh, and if you did like it and you found it thought provoking, then please like the video and share it with your friends. And if you have not subscribed to the channel uh, until now, please do so now. Uh, and in case you think why I'm looking dark on this side is because the light on this side just died. So anyway, this is Mukhtar Khan for Conversations. Good night.